When I uh, get an introduction like that, I wonder why I still don't have any money. But um, <laughs> my um, brother Andrew is uh, has even less money than I do by quite a considerable way. He's a an academic and uh, a geneticist at Trinity College Dublin, and um, he told me a great story about when he was an undergraduate there. Uh, he uh, studying genetics and uh, that kind of thing. And he had a lecturer who had a habit of pacing the stage rather like this as he talked. And what he was talking about was Pavlovian conditioning. And he'd walk across the stage like this, and my brother and his friends decided they'd see whether Pavlovian conditioning was a real thing or not, so that every time he walked to the left-hand side of the stage, they'd look incredibly interested and take notes and <laughs> be very eager. And every time he walked to the right-hand side of the stage, they'd all start yawning and going, Ugh and so on. And by the end of the term, the lecturer was completely unable to leave the left-hand state of the stage. And he did his entire lecture from that. So um, <laughs> I'm not going to talk to you about marketing or branding or anything of that kind. This is the, uh, uh, just a few general thoughts about thinking. And I've come to the conclusion that um, actually thinking is, is not a not a very big deal. In fact, most of what I've been thinking about today is how absolutely terrified I am to come and address you, which has sort of destabilized me from sort of clear thinking. Um, I talked to a very interesting bloke the other day called Ed Cook, who is a memory genius. He's a memory grandmaster. And uh, he told me that he'd once taken ketamine. And I thought, God, he's such an intelligent guy. Why would he ruin his life with this cattle tranquilizer? Because I don't know what ketamine is. Uh, actually, it turns out ketamine's a rather amazing thing. It uh, helps cure alcohol and heroin addiction with uh, ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. I don't know if you know that. But the effect of ketamine is that when you take it, instead of uh, going through your life going, oh, I'm such an asshole. Why did I say that in the meeting? Why didn't I? Oh, no, why have I done this? When you take ketamine, you go, hmm, I'm an asshole. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. So the question is, which is the rational bit? You know, somebody like me, full of fear and trembling, or Ed, uh, you know, he's only taken it once, by the way, don't report him to the police. Um, Ed with his uh, uh, ketamine, where is in a much more rational position, this altered state. Okay, so I'd ask you a question. Is intelligence a good thing? Okay, and while you're answering, yes, of course it is, I'll give you something else to think about. The Irish Times some years ago ran a survey from their readership in an attempt to discover who it was, uh, in gender terms, who wore the domestic trousers. And uh, they asked the question, who makes the decisions in your house? And one of the women answered, um, well, I make all the small decisions, and my husband makes all the big decisions. Fair enough. And they said, well, perhaps you'd expand on what you mean by that. And she said, well, by small decisions, I mean, um, uh, well, you know, I decide what the family will have to eat, for example, where the children go to school, that kind of stuff. And my husband makes all the big decisions, which involves things like whether there's a God or not, when the universe began, <laughs> and how the Palestinian question should be resolved. <laughs> now, <laughs> you sort of wonder who comes off worst in that story, really. Is it the man who overvalues himself by thinking that his paltry opinions on how the universe began matter? Um, or is it the woman who uh, meekly goes on cohabiting with this complete idiot, pompous ass? Um, and then when you're thinking about that for a minute, you might think it, it appears the story at first glance to illustrate, you know, sort of uh, men are from Mars, uh, women are from Venus, gender differences that are universal, but you might like to consider that it's helped along a bit, that story, because the people are Irish. Uh, it's something that's never occurred to me before, that, that that reference to the Irish Times makes you think you're allowed, it gives you permission to think in a certain way, that these people are kind of, uh, well, stupid perhaps, not to put too fine a point on it. And then you'll realize that, actually, Irish jokes aren't about stupidity. Um, I'm half Irish, so I can say these things. Uh, my brother marries an Irish girl. So 
they are actually exhibiting a kind of lateral creative intelligence where things are sort of turned on their head, they're turned upside down. Um, and a good example of that is the following Irish joke. Um, Paddy the Navvy goes for a job, and to, to test his suitability for the position, he's asked a very simple question. Explain the difference between a joist and a girder. And Paddy says, ah, well, sir, you see, a joist wrote Ulysses and girder wrote Faust. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's really neat. That's, he's obviously much smarter than the person who thinks he's stupid. By the way, why is the grass in Ireland always greener? They're all over here walking on ours. Um, now, at a deeper level, that Irish Times report demonstrates, I think, uh, the two types of knowledge that are available to us. There's direct personal experience, scientific method, you've actually been places, that kind of stuff, and received opinion. And at a deeper level still, it's a kind of a piece of really serious philosophy. The woman in the story rec represents one way of being, which is acceptance, okay, which is in all the great religions and philosophies, acceptance is urged upon us, and it's in everything from the stoicism of Marcus Aurelius to Islam and Tibetan Buddhism. And the man in the story represents another great human quality, which is curiosity. Okay, he, the attempt to understand and think about how the world actually works. The curiosity that drove Einstein and Galileo, and what of course got us into all that trouble in the Garden of Eden. It's always an interesting thing to me, not being a particularly religious person, but being open to ideas. Two things occur to me is that why did God in the Bible story forbid uh, curiosity, which is what's going on. The other interesting thing is that modern research says that it couldn't possibly have been an apple. It only says it's a fruit in the, on the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was most probably a banana. I think that was a rather charming <laughs> idea. Um, curiosity is something uh, that we think about a lot at QI because it appears to be unique to our species. Okay, um, We are the only species, as far as we know, which is interested in things which do not concern directly our own survival or that of our genes. So hedgehogs, for example, do not look up at the sky at night and wonder what all the sparkly bits are. And lobsters do not go around worrying whether or not they're popular. Um, only, <laughs> only people do that. Um, and it's a high calling, a great human calling to wonder, uh, to try to make a difference. And it's also a high calling to get on with your job and do it properly without complaint. Or as they say in Zen, chop wood and carry water. And in many ways, acceptance, passive acceptance and just getting on with things is a higher calling even than curiosity because everybody's born curious, but to be serene takes a great deal of effort. So going back to the question asked at the beginning, is intelligence a good thing? The great uh, English mathematician G.H. Hardy um, used to say that for any, uh, for any serious purpose, intelligence is a very minor gift. That's in itself a very intelligent remark, um, I think, because it, I think we overvalue intelligence as opposed to, say, intuition. But the question of the answer to is intelligence a good thing? The answer is not yes. It's not yes. If you think about it for five seconds, the answer is it depends on how it's used. Because many of the most appalling people in history were highly intelligent. Many of the most appalling people today are very intelligent. So intelligence isn't necessarily a good thing. So there are two ways of applying intelligence for good or ill. There are two ways of acquiring knowledge, received opinion, and direct personal experience. And there are two kinds of people in the world. Those people who divide people into two kinds of people. <laughs> and there's no, sorry, no, it's a stupid idea. Um, it happens that I've got two friends who are white Ghanaian chieftains. Rather an unusual job. Uh, chiefdom in Ghana is hereditary, pretty much exclusively. 
But on rare occasions, if somebody's done something for a village which is really special and really unusual, they can be, this person can be put forward uh, to be adopted into the local royal family, because all villages have local royal families in Ghana, and, um, and they can acquire chiefdom. So this friend of mine uh, inherited this position from his dad, who was in the colonial service, I think, out in Ghana, and did an amazing thing for the village, and they all voted him in to be chief. So, and Johnny says, one of the most extraordinary things about conversation in Ghana is that the average Ghanaian, uh, who's quite happy to uh, opine on whatever they're good at, whatever they're an expert in, it might be farming or it might be carpentry or motor mechanics or possibly quantum physics for that matter, they're quite happy to opine on those things, but no Ghanaian, as a matter of course, would ever dream of expressing an opinion because they just read it in the paper. I think that's an extraordinary difference between uh, what we do here, which is you know, absolutely commonplace, that most people's what they think they think is actually what Paul Dacre of the Daily Mail thinks. And, and they're just re-expressing that, so it's a kind of received opinion. I rang my other, I couldn't get hold of Johnny, but I rang my other uh, white Ghanaian chieftain friend, Humph, to ask him whether that was true or not of Ghana. And he said, I've, mm, I've not come across that. It's not, not occurred to me. So he couldn't possibly comment, which in itself, of course, is a very Ghanaian attitude. <laughs> and after all, what do I know? I've never been to Ghana. I'm only repeating what I've heard. <laughs> and when you think about it, that's what the whole of education's about. In geography, we learn about countries we've never actually visited. In history, we learn about kings and generals we're certainly never going to meet. And in science, we learn about atoms that not only are we not going to see, but nobody will ever see because you can't actually see an atom. We take all of these things for granted just because somebody else a little bit older than we are has told us so. So, um, ignorance is my stock in trade at uh, QI. About two and a half thousand years ago, at the Oracle at Delphi, five, which I'm sure you've heard, uh, was asked to opine on the question, who is the wisest man in Athens? Okay, the oracle, for those of you not familiar with the structure, was a kind of Deloitte of, of its day, a kind of KPMG. There were a lot of urbane, rather smooth priests who expressed in elegant verse the ravings of peasant lunatics, drug-praised peasant lunatics who sat over a cleft in the earth and inhaled these vapors and the priests would then put this into he hexameters. Uh, and that's how it worked. And um, it was uh, famous, the Oracle at Delphi, as I'm sure you know, for its elliptical uh, and frankly often disastrously mis misleading <laughs> verdicts on important matters. And it never ever gave a straight answer. So when it was asked, uh, who's the wisest man in Athens? On the one occasion in the entire history of the Oracle at Delphi, as far as we know, the Oracle replied unambiguously with the single word, Socrates. Nobody could believe this, they're waiting for the elliptical pronouncement, you know, the alternative thing, but it didn't come, so they rushed back to Athens and they found Socrates, who was sort of scruffy, ugly sod, and said, why does the Oracle think you're the wisest man in Athens? And Socrates said, well, he didn't know, but he thought it was probably because he was the only man in the city of Athens who knew that he didn't know anything. And that's wisdom. Um, so, not only are there two kinds of intelligence, there are two kinds of ignorance. There's the one that we all hate, the violent, prejudiced kind, uh, full of received, unconsidered opinion, where the ignoramus is so ignorant, they don't even know that they don't know anything. Rather like Donald Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns. <laughs> and there's the cheerful, uh, modest kind, that results from direct personal experience, from examining the universe carefully and in detail, and coming to realize that, in the words of Thomas Edison, we don't know a millionth of 1% about anything. And that's the kind of modest ignorance that we have at QI. So whether you uh, admit to ignorance, and most people are unwilling to, um, and whether you prove it, you need to get used to it. As long as it goes in 1987, <coughs> somebody estimated that the amount of information in reading the New York Times every day for a year 
you'd acquire as much information as the average man or woman in the 17th century would acquire in an entire lifetime. That's how much information we have to process. And it's going to get a lot worse. I did a job for Aviva uh, a couple of years ago, a very interesting corporate uh, video to launch the new chief executive. And we went to INSEAD in Fontainebleau near Paris, the business school, and talked to five experts on various um, aspects of the future. And Sumitra Dutta, who's the professor of, professor of business and technology there, said that the pace of change now is so fast, technological change he's specifically talking about, is so fast that if during the 20th century we can be said to have experienced 100 years of change, in the 21st century we will experience by the same measure the equivalent of 20,000 years of change. It's going to be so fast. Now when you've got all that change, you're going to get an awful lot more information going along with it. Um, and the question is, how on earth are we going to keep pace with this information? And I think the answer is, we can't. Um, you won't be able to keep up with it. So the only thing really we've got, got to do is, in the words of Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher, um, it's much better to know something about everything than everything about something. What we need to do is reacquire a kind of simple curiosity. I call it, look, mummy, a leaf, you know? Those of you who've got children know how they drive you mad. Look, mummy, look at this. And they've done a drawing, and you go, yes, darling, it's lovely. What, what is it? Um, and they bring you worms and stones and all that kind of thing. And we seem to lose that uh, for some reason. Um, human beings are born with very few fears. Um, falling, loud noises, and sudden movements are thought to be the only three that we're born with. Everything else, absolutely everything else, has to be learned. Public speaking is the number one fear. Um, uh, snakes and spiders, obviously, um, death, flying, difficult meetings, that kind of stuff. We're also born with insatiable curiosity, as I said before, and yet by the age of about eight, this curiosity, the look mummy a worm stuff, has been replaced by a combination of boredom and fear of getting the wrong answer. If things were rational, it'd be the other way around. Uh, as we got older and we realised how bottomlessly interesting the universe is, we'd uh, become less fearful. After all, Mark Twain used to say right at the end of his life, I'm an old man and I've known a great many troubles, but most of them have never happened. So there's never been a time in history when the curiosity, satisfaction of curiosity has been so easy. You read a lot in the papers about Wikipedia and people being rather disparaging about it and saying you know, that it's uneven in tone and that it's not peer-reviewed and so on, but without question, it's the greatest, largest certainly, but the greatest encyclopedia ever compiled in history. Um, it's, uh, it's got mistakes in it, of course, but so has the Encyclopedia Britannica. I've got three copies in my office, the 1911, the 1933, and the 1989, and I collect the mistakes in it. In 1964, a physicist called Dr. Harvey Einbinder read the whole of the Encyclopedia Britannica from cover to cover, and he found so many mistakes in it that he was able to produce a 390-page book called The Myth of the Britannica. So don't knock Wikipedia. It's fantastic. It's already, it's in 250 languages, the English edition alone is 30 times larger than the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's been estimated that it took about 100 million person hours to write, which is quite a lot. But when you think about it, the American technology professor and internet writer Clay Shirky did a comparative study on this, and he compared it to the number of hours that the average American watched television. And he worked out that if all the Americans who watch television from Friday night to Sunday night just stopped watching the ad breaks while they were watching television and did some research instead, we could have a new whole Wikipedia every weekend. It's about the same. 100 million person hours is spent watching, just watching the ad breaks on American television, just in America. So, discovering new information, which is what I do every day, is uh, the most fun that you can possibly have. Um, and it has a bearing on what we're doing to ourselves if we're not curious, if we're not wondering. That's what we think at QI, that curiosity is act actively good for you, that we call it the fourth drive. You know, your modern neo-Darwinist 
evolutionary psychologists say we have three drives, essentially food, sex, and shelter, like orangutans and chimpanzees. We at QI I think we've got a fourth one, curiosity, that you need that feeding just as you need the other drives feeding, otherwise you're kind of dying inside. We've just written a book, and I was, uh, got some great things that we found out in it. Napoleon wasn't short. He was two inches taller than the average Frenchman at the time and half an inch taller than the average Englishman. Uh, Mussolini didn't make the trains run on time. In fact, she made them slightly slower than before. Molotov didn't invent the cocktail. It was invented by Finnish people and it was named after him as an insult. Cheese doesn't give you nightmares. Britain produces more varieties of cheese than France. But the French, no Frenchman has ever heard the idea that cheese gives you nightmares. Isn't that amazing? The only person who thought the Battle of Waterloo was uh, won on the playing fields of Eton turns out to be Adolf Hitler. Uh, Wellington certainly didn't believe it. He hated school and he hated sport. Um, and I have heard a great thing on the radio the other day that in Germany they teach that the Battle of Waterloo was won by the Germans. Isn't that marvellous? <laughs> and of course it was, actually. Wellington was losing until Blücher turned up. Uh, what else? Mayflies. They don't live for just one day. Most of them live for four years. <laughs> they don't fly just in May. They fly all summer. And they aren't flies. Uh, <laughs> bats aren't blind. Penny blacks aren't particularly valuable. Counting sheep doesn't help you get to sleep. Cornishmen have never, ever, not one single instance of ever luring a ship onto the rocks. And in the Great Wall Street crash of 1929, not one single banker jumped off a skyscraper. Ignorance really is bliss. Thank you very much. <laughs>